thanks very much for inviting me along to give this presentation. Um, just at the outset, um, I know a lot of you guys would be familiar with both the NTA uh, and also Bus Connects and a lot of the work that we already do. So it might feel like a, a busman's holiday for some of you. Um, so if you want to multitask and have your sandwich and check your Insta at the same time, that's absolutely fine. I, I, I won't take offence to that. Uh, I also recognise that whilst Bus Connects and uh, Lewis Cross City, which I'll touch on, are were and are vast uh, projects in terms of their resources in terms of the scale of them and I know a lot of you may be involved in projects that are a lot smaller both in terms of resources or in terms of footprint or infrastructure or the build. Uh, I do feel though that a lot of the communication fundamentals still hold true and um, a lot of the stuff can be scaled up or scaled down so I'm hoping that there'll at least be some elements of this presentation that you'll find useful and that you can take away and maybe adapt or have a think about and maybe something that you could use in the future. Um, first of all, uh, there's a couple of things I want to talk about today. Um, who's the NTA? Now, I, I, I won't delay long on that because I'm sure a lot of you will know who the NTA are. Uh, I'm going to just give you an overview then of Lewis Cross City. Uh, one, because it's a project that we've completed, which is always good. Uh, two, um, I think it's a really good example of not only communication, but also the benefits of collaboration and planning and engagement. Um, also then I'll touch on um, Bus Connects, which is the single largest consultation process and project that the NTA has undertaken to date. It's, it's absolutely a, a beast. Uh, and then I'll give you some examples of how we communicate and how we engage with the public as well as agencies and then some learnings. So as I said, there's there's some stuff here that may or may not be relevant to you. So as I said, please feel free to dip in and out as, as you, as you uh, find it relevant. Uh, okay, for those who aren't aware of the NTA, it's the National Transport Authority. So as you can see there, it oversees the provision of bus, train, tram and taxi services in Ireland. Uh, I think the most important thing about the NTA is that uh, its remit is underpinned with legislation. It also forms huge parts of responsibility and authority within government uh, policies, including the National Planning Framework, the National Development Plan, and also most importantly and recently, the Climate Action Plan. So there's a massive responsibility uh, for the NTA to deliver on both infrastructure and climate action um, incentives and to, to do those in collaboration with both regional, local authorities and a myriad of agencies as well as the public and as well as lots of communities. So first of all, just three principles on communication. Um, first of all, I always find that some people not everybody, but some people think communication is can be seen just as an add-on, a bolt-on, something to do at the end, something once the planning's all done, the design's all done, all the uh, you know plans are ready, just let the communication people know and let them roll it out. Um, and I think that's a mistake. And I think it's something that people do at their peril. Uh, whilst you know the planning and the design and the construction of a project is hugely important. Uh, under communication, lack of communication, lack of engagement can legitimately undermine the very success of a project. And um, it's, it's really important that communication is at the middle and the forefront and central to all the decision making, not just at the end. So that's one thing I believe passionately about communication. The second thing to remember is that people will always say you didn't communicate enough. They'll always say that without a doubt, they'll always say. And then thirdly, they'll always say they never heard of a project. Regardless of how much communication you've done, they will say, we've never heard of it. I still have people telling me they've never heard of Bus Connects, which is, is quite extraordinary given the, the profile Bus Connects has. So they're kind of things that you just accept in the communication space. Um, and as I said, I feel very strongly that communication should be central and at the very start of all the planning processes when, when projects are started and when people are starting to think about projects. Okay, I'm gonna use Lewis Cross City, as I said, as an example. Uh, one, because it's done. Uh, I was director of communications for Lewis Cross City from 
2014 to 2017. It's a project that was over 300 million euro. Uh, it was the largest public infrastructure project in Dublin city centre in decades. Um, it was extremely difficult at the time, but now that we're in the white heat of bus connects, I look back on it fondly because as I said it was done, it was delivered and it's successful and, uh, and people now look at it as if it's always been there. Now the next slide is really busy guys and I know this has been recorded but uh, you know it, 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 you don't have to take in all this information and you can take it away with you. I mean I always think it's helpful to have lots of information on the slide one in case it's not been recorded and two there's nothing worse than listening to a presentation and then going away with a slide with just one word on the page and trying to figure out what was being spoken about. Now this is a snapshot of how good collaboration with agencies and engagement at a local level works. Now I'm not going to, I'll go through this really fast because I'm conscious that um, there's a lot of information here. Lewis Cross City, as I said, was a big project for the NTA. And from the start, we agreed that we needed a really collaborative stakeholder engagement approach. And that came from the very top. We had quarterly meetings which were chaired by the Minister of Transport. Uh, we actually had three ministers of transport. I think that's probably a record. We started with um, Leo Varadka, then we had Pascal Donahue, and we finished the project with um, Minister Shane Ross. So we had three ministers for transport. We had quarterly meetings um, with a round table with the department, with the minister, with TII, who were actually building the project, with the Gardaí, with Dublin City Council, ourselves in the NTA, Dublin bus, retail and business organisations, really important to get a sense of where everybody was at in advance of each stage of the project. Then we always had monthly meetings where the contractor was at the table with us and spoke about three months of the plans in advance. And that included, as I said, all the key stakeholders, all the transport operators, all decisions were made in advance and at that table. Nobody left the table without understanding what the next three months looked like. Um, we also had massive stakeholder engagement um, because we were going through the middle of the city centre. Businesses and communities were hugely important to us. So we had monthly presentations with TII and the NTA where we set out the plans which had been previously agreed at a strategic level and showed people everything that was going to happen. So that allowed them to feed back their thoughts and their inputs and some things we may not have thought about. And that, that continued throughout the project. Um, at a public engagement and a communication approach, we did something different. I think it hadn't been done before, where we actually set up a public information office with myself and my team in place uh, in just off Dawson Street, which at the time sounded very glamorous, but Dawson Street was one of the most difficult and most long-standing work sites that we had. So everybody was able to walk in and tell us exactly how they felt about the project and how exactly how they felt about how things were or weren't going right. So that was a new approach taken by us. We were on site, we were in there. So it had due process. It was our team was based there. But also members of the public um, could walk in and tell us exactly what they thought and um, give us feedback, look for information. Um, and it was very successful. Uh, we also had two local liaison officers, one for the south side and one for the north side. And these... Um, their roles, uh, John and Suzanne, were to actually literally walk the streets every day, engaging with the churches, the schools, the apartments, the houses, the hotels, the bars, shops, restaurants, letting everybody know what, what was coming up, when the plans were starting, what were the impacts on their parking, on their deliveries, on their bins, on their uh, business, uh, on their access, all that stuff we walked through. And they, again, was a really important, a really beneficial way of communication. So once we had things like a phone, an email, a website, and we pushed out lots of information that way, having people walking on the street and bringing the foreman along with our liaison offer to say, this business has a problem, this housing estate has a problem, this car park has, has no access, that really proved important. We also had a community gain um, project at the time where 
we do some really simple things like where a business had no access for a week, we provided vouchers or giveaways that people would make sure that the business was open, that when they reopened, that we would, um, that there was that there was vouchers there, there was free advertising we'd help them with. We also helped them set up a lot of their social media and their website just to give them some initiatives and support to help them know that whilst it's really difficult at the moment, and there were times that it was really difficult, the works were very intrusive and invasive, that we were trying to help them and to let them know that this was going to be worth it in the long run. We also helped a lot of communities along the way, small communities, sports clubs, um, clubs for the elderly, a lot of stuff on, on a local level, which really helped. Uh, we worked hard on making sure that accessibility information was there because, you know, for example, if we were doing a piece of work on, uh, on a street, we had to move a bus stop. We had to let people know that that bus stop was now 50 metres down the road. So we worked very closely with Dublin Bus and other operators to get that information out there. And there's a travel assistance programme that is funded by the NTA and run by Dublin Bus, where they actually have people who go out and go on bus routes where there's changes to bus services and help the people who are less um, mobile to understand the changes, be they permanent or be they temporary. So that was a really good example. Now, I know that's a real, a lot of talk and a lot of stuff there, but that was a really good example of a project that worked end to end through lots of collaborative planning. And um, as I said, it's there now, you know, people have totally forgotten all the disruption and, and it's a huge benefit to the city. So it's about the perseverance and, and working with all your stakeholders. So that's that example there. Now, Bus Connects my favorite this is the project that i'm involved with so far um and so far bus connects has started in 2017 uh bus connects dublin is a program of nine elements so it, it's it's quite a it's quite a widespread, whereas a lot of focus has been on two key elements, which I'll talk about, which is the network redesign, which is where we've changed the services and the bus routes, and then the infrastructure, which is where we're pushing in extra bus lanes and segregated cycle lanes. So they're the two key elements that I'm working on at the moment, but there's lots of other things. There's the park and ride, there's the ticketing, there's the next, um, we're, we're transitioning, not just to a low admissions bus fleet, we're actually now trans, uh, this transitioning to a zero emissions bus fleet. So we're gonna have also upgrading our bus stops and our shelters and we have a new bus livery. So there's lots of different things going on, but the two key things really are the network, which is the services, and also then the infrastructure, which is effectively your bus lanes and your cycle lanes, which is going to transform the city and the greater Dublin area. So how far have we gotten? And these are some of the tools and processes that we've used to get to where we are. Okay, the network redesign. And I think the reason I'm showing this slide is really just to give you a sense of how projects can be very, I'm trying to find the right word. They can be very uh, difficult. They, 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 they can prove to have a lot of resistance to them. They can prove to become extraordinarily emotive, extraordinarily uh, and upsetting for a lot of people. Uh, what we decided to do in July 2018 was to do something that hadn't, hasn't been done before. Now, previously, I worked in Dublin bus, so I'm very well aware of the emotional attachment that people have to their buses, uh, how important their local service is, how important the, uh, having that, that bus service, uh, because lots of people don't have access to cars. Lots of people, the bus is their only, uh, their only way, mode of transport, they're only linked to the community and to meeting other people and getting to appointments. We decided that uh, Dublin bus and the bus network had grown it had grown organically. I mean, when I worked in Dublin bus, when there was a new housing estate, when there was a new business park, the bus route just got longer. We just followed the development. And because Dublin is developed in such a way that it's a low density, very widespread, low level um, city that is now expanded to Kildare, Mead, uh, Wicklow, uh, almost to Louth, it's, it's huge footprint. So the bus service is, is massive. So it needs to be reconfigured to make it a much more cohesive 
efficient, streamlined service. So we started that consultation in uh, 2018, massive reaction to it. Um, at the start, very negative reaction to it because it was a, a complete change. It was a, a complete um, rewriting of the network as people knew it. Everything down from the number that, that the bus would be called to uh, how the bus would operate. Um, but notwithstanding that, and notwithstanding the fact that we had 72,000 submissions, all of which were read and fed into our final plan, the plan is now in place. The network is now complete. The new uh, network is being rolled out. The H-spine is actually starting in three weeks' time. So I suppose the lesson for this is that notwithstanding the scale of some projects and how they may seem too ambitious or too drastic or too um, big at the start, that if you listen to people, if you engage, if you continually consult, that you will get to where, to where you need to be. So that's really the lesson from the network redesign. Um, and you know, this is just, this is just a slide shows you a massive example of uh, the huge amount. And I, and I appreciate this was on an unprecedented level. This was something that the NTA had never done before. It was something that we did in collaboration with Dublin Bus. It was something Dublin Bus had never done before. Uh, we had done minor changes. We had done small tweaks to the network, but we now needed to do a total re-evaluation um, and a total re-design um, of the network. So we did a huge amount of consultation. We did three rounds. And from that three rounds, we are now at the place where we're rolling out a better network for the bus. And not just for the current bus users, but for the future bus users and the accessibility that that offers people, especially again, as I said, people who want to use public transport, who don't have a car and don't want to have a car. This will allow them more access. And uh, that, again, I won't go through the details, but that shows you the level of consultation that we did. And that's the services. And that is now in place and has been rolled out. It'll be rolled out over the next two years with Dublin Bus. So it won't be just a massive change. So people will have time to be informed and educated as we roll out each spine and each bus service. Okay, so this is the one that we're working currently on, and this is the infrastructure. So basically, this is where we are looking at the existing road work and saying we need more dedicated bus corridors and dedicated and segregated safer cycling, and they are hand in hand. So you get your better bus segregate you get your better bus lane uninterrupted at the moment about a third of all bus lanes uh, have to go back in and out of traffic so any gains you have in a bus lane you lose them when you go back into general traffic so what we're trying to create is this network of uh, over 200 kilometers of dedicated bus lane alongside segregated not just paint on the road but segregated with a curb uh, cycle lanes or cycle tracks and where we can't do that we do off off route cycle lanes and in some places we've had to do some sharing but the vast majority is is going to be segregated cycle lanes and that's hugely important um, so we've done three rounds of public consultation uh, we've had 32,000 submissions again all of which have been read and have fed into the continual designing and planning and uh, we've done them from, from 2018 up until 2020. And I think what's important for people to remember is these are already really busy bus lanes and bus radial corridors. So they already have vast numbers of traffic of buses and cyclists. What we need to do is we need to take that space, which is finite, and all your engineers will know that, that you know, until somebody figures out how to how to bend physics and you know stretch space, we have a finite amount of space, and we need to make sure that we use it in the most efficient way, and make sure we have good pedestrian access, good air cycling, and safe cycling, dedicated bus, so we're not caught up in congestion, and still give space for the private car. And you know, bus connect isn't against the car. Um, you know, lots of people think that we are, but it's about getting the balance right and moving towards that balance. So again, planning, I can't say it often enough, pre-planning, public consultation and stakeholder engagement is really important. Now, at a high level, we have put in place a lot of the same processes that we used for Lewis Cross City. 
So we have strategic meetings with our councils, uh, our councillors, our chairpeople of the transport strategic policy committees, I want to say. I hope that's right. And I hope I haven't left out any of the local authorities there, because uh, I'm sure some of you are on the call, so apologies if I have. We have monthly and bi-monthly meetings to keep make sure that the officials and the executives and the councils are up to date on our plans and our designs, and they're feeding back in. We work really closely with TII in relation to roads and how we're going to uh, interact and, inter and there's interchanges with roads and all that. So everything is constantly kept every council kept up to date. I know a number of the councils, including DCC, have dedicated liaison teams to work directly with the Bus Connects team. Again, keeping everybody up to speed. We know what they're doing, they know what we're doing. And again, that means that everybody is involved and is aware of what's happening. We have regular updates with a lot of the special interest groups, including the cycling groups, disability groups, PPNs, business rep groups, public transport operators, like we have a huge network of stakeholders and every one of them has to different degrees, a level of both interest and concern and input into the project. So you, you can't do a project, be it small or large in a silo. You can't do it without talking to people and without hearing what they have to say. It's not going to work otherwise. So we have ongoing engagement. Um, for example, like there's going to be a number of interchanges. So we're talking to lots of big stakeholders, UCD, Tala Shopping Centre, Blanchestown Shopping Centre, Liffey Valley, working with key stakeholders on all of those. And it's not just about buses and cycling pedestrians. Everywhere we can, we're looking to improve public realm. We're looking to improve the urban villages. We're looking to improve the environment that people have. So it's, as I said, it's not just about buses and cyclists. Um, I think this is a really important slide. Now, I'm not sure how I am for time, so I just want to make sure I'm not either going too fast or too slow. I'm conscious that I'm throwing a lot of things at people. Again, back to what I said at the start, I think it's really important that there is a dedicated communication team. And that may only be one person if the project's a small uh, project. But I think they need to work hand in glove with the design team. Again, it's not about just letting people know at the end. People have to be involved, the communication have to be involved, and we have to be engaged with the design team. And they have expertise. We also have expertise that we need to share and to make them aware and vice versa. Um, we also endeavor to, 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 you know, to a reasonable and practical level, you know, have open and ongoing engagement with uh, stakeholders. You know, people deserve to be heard, they deserve to be listened, and we also have deserve to tell our story and to explain and to show what our aims and our objectives are. Um, you should never assume that people know what you're talking about or that they have a level of understanding. I never underestimate people's intelligence. You never do that, but you, you should never overestimate either their, their knowledge of what you're doing. You can't just assume, of course, they know about it. They must have read about it. They must have heard about it. You have to really take time to explain things to people. And again, as I say, communications and the person who's involved with communication and talking about the project and defending it, in many cases, has to be at the decision table at the earliest point. Um, COVID, obviously, has been extraordinarily difficult for everybody, both personally and, and at every level. It's, it's changed our lives, it's changed everything we do and how we approach things. And you know that included Bus Connects and the project. And, and we were really keen that the project didn't get derailed significantly during bus during the COVID pandemic. And you know, that was really difficult at the start because you know, you know, everybody, you know, we just didn't know where we were, you know, as individuals or as projects, but we realized that we have to keep going because Ireland will recover, the city will recover, the city will rebuild, the economy will get going again, and people need to, we need to have that infrastructure ready to go. There's no point in three, five years, people turn around saying, look, the city's jammers, the city's congested, you know, we haven't addressed our climate issues, what happened in the last couple of years. So we we have to keep going. Um, so we pivoted as soon as we could um, into different ways of communication and engaging with people. And, you know, we're doing it now. Everything's virtual. 
um, you know, we, we, we've gotten used to it. So we continued our conversations. So even in the last round of public consultation, we've spoken to over a thousand potentially impacted properties uh, and their owners. So we've continued that either uh, through face-to-face -face where possible if they want socially distance, uh, you know, um, by Zoom, by phone, by email. We've had community forums. Um, we established 16 community forums, one for each corridor, and they've proven really successful. Um, they represent, we've invited at least, uh, people to represent their residents, their special interest um, group, um, their road, their, their, their business representatives. And uh, we've had 42 of those meetings. Um, and we've, you know, the membership has vastly increased with COVID, <laughs> weirdly. We've had more people able to access and go come along to them because we're doing them on Zoom. So we had uh, 1,200 people attend the last round of uh, community forums. They've worked really well. And what has also worked really well is organically from the community forums, we've had local residents group come up to us and say, we have a particular issue, we have a particular concern, we actually have an idea. And uh, we've met those groups and we've met almost 70 residents groups and we've met them a number of times. And, you know, places like Stony Batter, places like uh, Moby Road, Inchicore, um, Marion Road, Pembroke, lots of different groups, Bagot Street Traders. And what started off perhaps as more, no, you know, down with this sort of thing, a plague on all your houses, has now evolved where people have said, okay, it's not bus connects against trees. It's not bus connects against cars. So we worked with people and people are much more willing to save trees, keep the trees, which we don't want to get rid of trees, but we need the space. But people have now realized that if we do a one-way system for the cars, that the trees can stay. If we do signal priority, if we do bus gates, where you have a continuous flow of buses and the car is held back for a certain amount of time, then the road doesn't have to be widened as much. And that has happened through ongoing engagement and conversations with people. And we've listened and we've changed our plans. And we would hope that at the end of this, that there will be a net uh, increase of trees. Obviously, there will be some impact, but trees in Bagot Street, trees, trees on Pembroke Road, trees on Moby Road, trees on Marion, trees along Finglas, all areas where people were raised concerned. We've managed to now find other options through working with local communities of not having to impact on those trees. And that's a great result for both the community and ourselves. Notwithstanding that, there's going to be an impact on the private car but we will create a better alternative for people through cycling, through better pedestrian um, facilities, through increased urban realm air spaces, and through a better bus service, all of which give people that option. Instead of just automatically walking out of the house and taking the car, they'll know there's a really good alternative there for a bus or for cycling, or even for walking for shorter distances. So as you can see, it's extreme, extremely busy. The website is very busy. It's our main repository for all our information and we keep updating it. We have a free phone in place, which is really important for people who aren't uh, you know, digital savvy and who want to talk to somebody. We offer a callback service and they will talk to one of our designers. They won't talk to um, me because they don't want to talk to me a lot of the time, they will talk to on the design team uh, and they'll get to talk to about the, the details of the project. The virtual rooms were hugely successful. We had tens of thousands of visitors to it. We've had thousands of phone calls and thousands of emails, but all of which have helped us get to a place we are now going to, um, we're finalising our onboard Panola applications. Uh, so they, we hope to submit uh, later on this summer the applications to onboard Panola and hopefully uh, we will have really good applications, all of which will include environmental impact assessment reports, traffic um, and transport impact assessment reports, as well as the preferred option reports um, to onboard Panola and hopefully we will get a, a positive result from that as well. And there will also be, just for people's information, there will now, these were all non-statutory public information um, consultations that we ran, but we felt they were really important to do. But there will also be a statutory public consultation during the onboard Panola uh, process. So people will have another 
opportunity to have their say. So more talking with people. Um, accessibility is really important. Uh, so we've endeavoured uh, to make sure that all of our information is as accessible as possible. And um, this takes time. And that's one thing I'd, I'd ask people to make keep in mind. There is a huge amount of time and pre-planning which is required. So, for example, we did hard copies of brochures. Every single round we produced hard copies because people like hard copies. I like hard copies to, to, to look through and at my leisure. Uh, we also, uh, and thousands of these were made available for both individuals who may, properties may be impacted, for all our public representatives to receive copies, for uh, people in the community to receive copies. So we provided, as I said, tens of thousands. For the public information events, we went out to the communities. So we found hotels, GA uh, halls, community centers on the routes, on the corridors, so people could access them. They didn't have to travel into the city center. They didn't have to travel that far. So they were out there and each public um, information event that we held. At each event, there was teams of our designs, of our consultants, of the NTA people. So there was the people who were there could tell the people who came along the in-depth detail and the rationale and the reason and the impact. It wasn't just people walking in who were just had no idea. We had the teams who were designing it there at every event. They won't thank me for that because there was a lot of hours put in for that. So we did the public information events on each corridor. We also did the community forums um, out in the community again, so people didn't have to travel that far. And we ran them in the evening so people had time to get home and um, have something to eat and, and come along in the evening. So again, we tried and endeavored to make it as easy and as accessible for people. Again, all the hard copies, we did them in an online version. We also did them in HTML, which allows people who are visually impaired and have screen readers or computer readers for the computer to read the document back to them. We obviously did Irish formats, which is important as well. Uh, also, um, when we were out in the public meeting face to face pre COVID, we also had a, a Irish sign language interpreter there for people who arrived who had uh, who were deaf or who required extra assistance in understanding um, people talking to them. We also created easy to read versions of all documents, um, which I think is really important. Uh, they're, they're, they're a great tool uh, for when you have a lot of technical information where they distill it down and make it really easy and understandable. And that they were really important for the network, which was which was which is quite difficult for people to comprehend. We also run radio, digital newspapers, outdoor. And we also when we do outdoor posters, we always try and make sure that we're in places where commuters are going to gather. So bus shelters, people on the bus, people standing at a bus can read the information and go, OK, something's going to happen on this corridor. Something's happened to my bus service. Also dark Lewis Irish Rail locations. And during COVID, we, we, we actually did a piece of research uh, to find out because people were at home, where were they getting their information? Because we were doing a round of consultation during COVID. And we found that people were using their local newspapers, their free sheets. They were watching the news more than ever. And when they were going out, they were just going out once a week. So they were going to the groceries, they were going to the post office. So we made sure to have outdoor posters just in those locations. So at least they did pick up on the information there if they didn't see it in their local newspaper. I'm a really strong believer in local newspapers and free sheets. Active travel, which again, I know a lot of you are really interested in and involved in. So as we know, again, I suppose one of the, um, if there is any type of silver lining with this pandemic, there is a new impetus and um, a big push on active travel. Um, as we know, the government uh, in the programme for government, there's a massive commitment to 1.8 spend on walking and cycling. Um, you know, the NTA is hugely involved in that and that uh, we have a massive investment programme, 130 million compared to last year. And there's, I think, 233 new projects this year alone. Um, I think what's really important um, and something which was probably lacking is that there's actually, not only is there financial resources being put behind this, but there's actual human resources as in jobs, because it's all very well having money, 
but if you don't have the ability or the people to spend it, um, then it's, it's it's not going to go anywhere. So there's new jobs being created to allow local authorities, uh, agencies to have people um, to, to deliver these projects. Um, so we're looking at a thousand kilometers of improved walking and cycling infrastructure by 2025, you know, expanding the bike schemes, massively increasing the smarter travel, both education and work, and obviously increasing uh, the green schools and safe to schools uh, projects with Antashka. And those things are really, really important. We have a generation behind us who are saying, we want active travel, we want sustainable travel. We don't want to have congestion. We don't want diesel, we want electric, we want um, no fumes, we want no pollution. Um, but we also appreciate both the NTA and myself that there's lots of organizations who don't have the experience in providing consultations, in engaging with people um, and don't have the resources. So we have a draft, um, you'll be glad to know, of pu public consultation guidelines, which we've been working on for the last number of months. And this document is going to be, and I hope it's going to be a really helpful toolkit for organizations and co um, consultants and authorities to allow them to really have something to go from A to Z on how to run a public consultation. And it's not about the NTA saying, oh, we know everything about public consultations. You know, we, we have the learnings, as we like to call them, uh, otherwise known as the scars of public consultation. So I think we've a lot of experience which will help people um, to basically just take, take a document and say, okay, these are the steps, these are the stages, this is the checklist that I need to make sure that we have done. And again, these can be scaled up or scaled down. If you're doing three kilometers of improving the pedestrian area and pushing in a dedicated cycleway, it might only require a leaflet drop. But that has to be done two weeks in advance, that has to be prepared, that has to be given out to all the people on the road, that has to be made sure that there's, if there's businesses, that the delivery vans know that there's going to be parking changes, that they know where the bins are going to be picked up. So there's little things that have to be done, even if it's a small project or if it's a large project, and they all have to be planned and you need to know your stakeholders. Um, as I said, it's very easy to say on a stretch of road, okay, it's just all those houses, but it's not just that, it's the deliveries, it's the people who visit, it's the people who use that road to get to another destination. So you have to identify and to think about all the different stakeholders. So this document, albeit in draft form, when it's released by the NTA, will really be a step-by-step -step, um, process of how to run a public consultation. And again, it's not saying, oh, we know everything, this is, this is the best way to do it. I think it's just going to be a really good, helpful toolkit for people. And I think what would be really important and what I always look for when I look in a document like this is the appendix where it shows an example. Here's an example of an email that you'll send out. Here's an example of a flyer that you'll put on every car that's parked on a street where in two weeks time, they won't be able to park there anymore. Here's an example of you know, a script for a radio ad, or here's an example of what a tweet might look like. So it's going to be very functional as a document, it's not theoretical, it's going to be a practical document. So again, that's in draft and um, we'd hope that that will be available as soon as possible, but it's it's it's, it's uh, still within the NTA um, being worked through because we need to make sure it's the right document for everybody, but we'd hope that that's available sooner rather than later. Okay, so this is just an example of some of the communication material that we've used. I think you're all very familiar with them. Uh, what, you know, the really important thing is, is that when you give information that it's understandable, that you, you don't use technical jargon where possible, where you try to reflect how people receive their information in everyday life. Everybody, almost everybody uses a smartphone, uses a laptop, watches TV, so you need to present your information in the way that people see their news or get their other information, you know, not just flat technical engineering and no, no disrespect to engineering. That's, that's what, you know, the country's built on, but it has to be understandable and digestible to people. And that's where communication comes in, where we kind of translate the technical information into something that's much more understandable and, and relevant to people. Um, 
you know, this this is the document I was talking about, the easy to read, where it really just breaks down into very understandable uh, format of how a project is going to change and what it will mean for you. And again, there's just some examples of some of the press ads that we ran in local newspapers, letting people know where they can come along to get information and what the project's about and the fact that we are listening and we are engaging and they do have an opportunity. It's not a de facto, you know, it's not a tick box exercise. And I think if anybody knows the NTA and has been involved with Bus Connects, they will see how we have evolved from being there was a poster on uh, Bagot Street uh, at one stage where people thought we were taking down the mature trees that are in the middle of Bagot Street, which we never were. And there was a big poster there saying uh, the NTA butchers of Bagot Street. Uh, so uh, that, that's how misinformation and disinformation can get out there and take a life of its own. And that's why it's important where we always balance it with the correct information. And uh, I, I was on Bagot Street there recently and they had tied red ribbons around the trees three years ago. And those red ribbons are still there. So they obviously weren't biodegradable, the ribbons that the people were putting on, even though we weren't touching the trees, the ribbons are still there. Um, okay. Um, and this is, this is an example of a virtual room. I think this was done by ACOM and um, hugely um, beneficial. We had more hits to our virtual public information rooms than ever we did to people coming along. As you can see, uh, the information is really clear. You can download the documents. Um, people can take their time. It's 24 seven. Uh, and we also had audio files accompanying the information rooms so people could listen to the information if, the, if they weren't or didn't want to just have to read it. So you can see there, um, that was really, really important that, that those virtual rooms, and I think they're the standard and they're the way to go for people um, from now on. And I think they're, they're a really great tool for people. Um, so they, they were really important. Um, this is something else that we've just started using. Um, and this isn't live, so I'll just show you two slides. I think this is Jacob's. Um, if anyone's on the Jacob's call, on the call, it, it, it's really impressive. It's, it's a map uh, tool. Uh, so basically, when it's live, you can see a Google map there of a street. And um, what we're doing is then overlaying what we plan to do. So it allows people, so you can see a line down the middle there. So when this is live, it slides back and forth. So you can see now to future, but it allows people to really understand visually what the um, what the program, what the, what, what the change to the street is going to look like. And I think it's much more effective. And as I said, it's a really impressive piece of uh, kit, which um, again, may be standard for a lot of other organizations, but we're just rolling it out now and it's proved to be really, uh, really informative for us. So that's something else that we're doing. Now, let me see, do I have any other slides? Oh yeah. Now I'm gonna stop sharing and see if I can pull up this screen. We on occasion have used SurveyMonkey as a way of uh, obviously doing surveys and getting a people's top line input on principles or observations of plans that we're going to do. Uh, it's, it's pretty rudimentary, it's pretty basic, uh, the, the SurveyMonkey, um, and no offense to SurveyMonkey, uh, as a company, it, it provides a very good service. But what we're trying to do is try to continually evolve uh, how we interact and how we engage and how we provide more information. Um, and we are going to now use this style, it's, it's a open house, um, and we're going to be using it in the coming weeks. Um, many of you will be glad to know that Bus Connects has now gone national. We've managed to get out of the suburbs of uh, Dublin. So Bus Connects Cork is going to start at the beginning of July. And we're going to start with uh, a conversation about how we upgrade and improve the bus network, which again is the services. So that's the bus number, the bus route and the bus services, where it goes, how often it goes and where it stops, et cetera. So we're gonna start with that. And we're going to use um, this uh, type of survey, advanced survey monkey. So just so you can see, not only is it going to ask questions, but it also provides people information. So when they click on this link and go in, they can read about what we're asking before they take part in the survey. And I think it's going to be really helpful. Um, and again, this is one that was done in Salem, Albany, 
but again, it provided lots of information before you asked people questions. So they got a real much better understanding of what we were asking of them. Again, it showed them how the services could be changed and improved and what it would mean for them. So again, it's a really simple example of how we're trying to improve on our level of engagement. So I think that is the, I'm gonna stop sharing that, but I just go to my last slide guys, uh, and then I am finished. Um, so in summary, if, if, if you take anything away from this presentation, I suppose the thing is regardless of, you know, the reaction you get, um, the pushback you get, um, some of people saying this is this is a terrible idea, this is not thought through, this is just back of the cigarette pack kind of idea. Um, just sorry, once you have a good project and once you are clear in what your objectives is and what the deliverables are, you need to keep that at the center of all your decision making. It's, it can be easy to be swayed and influenced and doubt, but once you keep clear about this is what we're delivering, this is what the benefits are going to be, that always has to be at the core of what you do, as I said. Um, so you need to always remember why you're doing the project you're doing in spite of some of the reactions, reactions you may receive. Um, advanced planning. Um, never underestimate the amount of time it takes to prepare, even on a small project. Um, quality of information, it needs to be practical, it needs to be understandable, it needs to show that you're open and you're engaging. Um, also, the integration at the earliest possible stage um, with both the design, the planning, and as I said, back to communication, having people like uh, communication it, sitting around the table. Know your stakeholders. Um, you know, Lewis Cross City, you might think, okay, it's the city centre, but if you look at Stevens Green to the bottom of Dawson Street, you have the OPW, you have businesses, you have restaurants, you have bars, you have churches, you have people living over the shop, you have uh, schools, you have um, commuters, you have car parks, you have every possible combination of stakeholder possible even though you don't think you do so you really need to think about who are your stakeholders and what is their level of issue um early engagement with them people don't like surprises people don't like change they don't like surprises they may not like what you're doing but at least if they're informed they can start to think about it and what it means for them you know things are complex but they don't have to be complicated so always try and think through your communications before you bring it out uh, be willing to listen you know, um, we've always listened, you know, and where there are valid, realistic, and if they're suitable suggestions, be willing to take them on board, be willing to change your mind, be willing to be influenced. But again, always keeping, you know, your core objectives in place. And as I said, uh, I always say, you know, you need a level of emotional intelligence uh, uh, doing this job. You know, people it's their livelihoods, it's where they live, it's where they walk, it's their bus service, it's where they cycle, it's their community, it's their house, it's their land. So it's being respectful for that to them, even though sometimes, you know, people can be very upset, you know, they can be very disturbed, they can be very, you know, uh, overwhelmed by it, and they may just take that out on you, but you need to just listen to them and to help understand them. So that's me done I think so I'm not sure